just introduce this. Just to introduce the speakers here, we have myself, Stephen Selgrade. I'm a senior marketing manager at Critical Start, and I'll be your MC today. So pretty quickly here, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan Mariello, who's our chief security officer, also at Critical Start. He's going to talk to you about some of the cybersecurity threats facing education and how uh, you can use MDR, that's managed detection and response, to address those threats. Then I'm super excited. We have Fran Watkins here from uh, Centennial School District, and he is actually a MDR customer. So he's gonna talk to us about his experience in a little Q&A section. And then we're gonna wrap it up with Alex Humphrey. He's gonna show you a little demo of our technology, what makes MDR possible with ZTAP, and then our mobile app, which our users can access on the go to see alerts, take actions, and do lots of other stuff to make their lives easier. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jordan. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you guys all for joining. Um, right as we're kicking it off, I, I was prepping for my uh, presentation this morning and just reviewing my notes, and, and we have a kind of daily review of Threat Intel activities with our CTI team this morning. And I felt like it was relevant to include this considering the context of our presentation today. Um, the CTI team at Critical Start brought me some a research activity um, that we're sending out an advisory on today, um, but I thought I would share it with the audience here. Um, we're tracking a significant increase in attack um, attacker activity against education targets with a focus on higher ed, but not limited to just that. We're also seeing it on K through 12 as well. Um, it includes um, increased conversations about targeting on Russian cybercrime forums and dark web. So specifically targeting based on uh, seeing a return to school happening here soon and looking to try to cause potential disruption. Uh, we're seeing an increase uh, in scanning and reconnaissance activity against um, education networks. And we're also seeing an increased uh, increase in botnet activities. Um, coming out of education networks that are hitting IP addresses that are generally tracked by different members of the intelligence community organizations and CTI organizations um, that have been reported. So in particular, it's TrickBot and QBot activity. Um, all of this really ties back to additional ransomware campaign activity that we've just seen the general uptick on. I'm sure everybody's read plenty about it, but we're definitely seeing a little bit of motivation increase for potential uh, disruption and potential opportunity to make a little more revenue for some of these cybercrime organizations by timing the return to school with potential attacks. Um, we have a general uptick and increase against US institutions in general. Um, that just has really to do with geopolitical events that are happening right now. And that's caused some of this uptick and even what might be considered hostility in the cybercrime world against US organizations. Um, but right now, there's also an additional targeting mechanism that seems to be happening for um, education right now. So we wanted to share that, um, even though that's kind of still developing activity, and we'll have more that's coming out about that over the next coming days. So that being said, let's jump in, and talk a little bit about MDR. So to do that, <clears throat> I'm going to give a very brief history on how we've done analysis and why MDR matters and what we're doing with MDR to help solve problems. Uh, there's traditional ways that we've looked at security analytics uh, throughout our industry. It goes back 22 years or so when we really started getting deep into this and, and really when I first got into the space as well um, and, and started my career in cyber in the military and we worked on a specific model and that model has gone through an evolution over the years that maybe has not been entirely intentional to get to the destination we are at but the destination we are at is um, an ability to respond to incidents to react to incidents to deal with attackers but not in a comprehensive and not always completely effective manner and that has to do with the way some of this has evolved and some of the approaches we've taken and that's why we think we want to talk about both our approach and why mdr is so important especially in education right now with how attackers and prioritization and even the intelligence that we're seeing right now around it is shifting towards targeting those organizations so if we go back, 
when I first got in, we were working in a decentralized analysis model. Right? And what I mean by this is you didn't have a centralized technology, it's centralized people. I um, mean, even those were decentralized to, to some extent. And so you had different people who were different experts on each different technology. And if you had an incident, put all those people in a room or on a video teleconference and try to begin to map out what's happening manually. Most detection happened by humans saying, hey, something is wrong with X functionality or Y device. And that usually became the, the indicator that investors or incident response needed to start. <clears throat> Even in military and duty sectors, we were still the same way at that time. That failed us miserably across many organizations, both commercial and public. And that led to the evolution of us moving to a centralized and prioritized analysis model. Right? So some projects, we created new technologies out of that SIM. I mean, what did SIM add for us? Two key things, normalization and correlation. Right. These were brand new concepts to combine together because what it allowed us to do that was different is correlate different data types together to do analysis. So we did that. We had this moment where we said, oh, my God, we've got complete visibility, which really followed quickly by, hey, we're completely overwhelmed with complete visibility. We have way more alerts than we could ever possibly deal with, way more data than we could ever possibly analyze. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to prioritize it. Let's break it down critical, high, medium, low, and we'll triage in order of what we think is the important priorities. <clears throat> now, the problem with that approach is that those priorities don't actually align to what matters for organizations today. Generally speaking, they're fairly arbitrary. They have to do with the vulnerability rating. They have to do with contextual data about the industry. Um, they have to do with the signature and the detection itself, written by a vendor usually, but it doesn't have anything usually to do with the business, the customer, the enterprise network that it's actually occurring on. And that lack of context means it's not necessarily the best way to actually look at that data or determine what you should and should not look at. That's why we've had so many problems in lower priority alerts. Well, we've evolved from that. Right? And we've said, well, this isn't working. So what we need to do is add incident orchestration. We need to speed this up. Right? And the problem is not necessarily the model or prioritization lack in context or, or even how we've centralized. The, the problem is we're not doing fast enough. So if we add speed, that will solve the problem. Well, I, I think we've been working with SOAR platforms long enough to see that breaches are still happening. And SOAR has not completely solved the problem for us. And we still have work to do as an industry to be able to actively resolve the number of alerts required for us to find the incidents that exist in networks. And we've had this approach where we've looked at it from both a prioritization approach, right, where we've said, hey, well, we're going to focus on a certain number of these. Usually we're going to tier these off based on how much budget and how much people we have. I did the same thing. I ran global security operations at Experian for quite some time, and we had to make the same de decision, even with a global SOC with analysts in three continents, and I had people in Texas and England and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Even with all of that, I, we still had to say, hey, we can only do criticals and highs. The problem is, is that we have a significant amount of breach activity that happens below that, right? The, the vast majority of the alerts are actually medium and low priority alerts. And there's absolutely nothing that says a medium or a low priority alert cannot lead to or be the direct action that starts a breach that has a negative impact for an organization. And we have plenty of examples of these. And we can go through a list and then we'll try not to call out names to harm any companies for the sake of them, but a lot of you people already know who these organizations are. And we've seen billion dollar losses from breaches that have happened in medium and low priority alerts. I've been impacted in particular by low priority alerts. Uh, an example that's not on the list, Department of Veterans Affairs, that was a low priority alert when they had their breach in Millpurse. And uh, that one impacted me. My records were impacted as a part of that. Low priority, still having significant impact in organizations. And so the question that we ask as a result of that is why can we not contextualize and prioritize the right alerts? And the answer to that is because context matters, right? It is that we can't look at priority without including context to understand what matters to a business. And it's not just CVE or MITRE or the vulnerability rating, um, depending on what vendor that you're looking at. It's not just what priority did the vendor assign to this signature when they wrote it. It's, hey, what actually matters to the business based on what we're seeing right now? How does this actually apply to an organization based on the context of what actually exists in their network? So an example of a critical alert that would not be a critical because it doesn't understand context is a Linux attack Right, a signature that detects a Linux attack when the customer doesn't have Windows. Right, real world scenarios, you get a brand new Linux zero day. 
right? Worst of the worst, remote code execution, root privileges, let's just say it's SSH and it's externally exposed and everybody should be aware of this. IPS vendor writes a new signature, we're detecting it, we escalate to the customer, wake up the security director at 2 a.m. and he's not particularly happy with us because in his DMZ that's actually externally exposed, he has no Linux servers, it's all Windows. Well, the context of understanding that customer's network would help us understand that critical priority at an alert level does not mean critical priority at an incident level. And that helps us actually understand what we really should be looking at for a customer, understanding that context. And this works in the inverse, too, is that we have the low priority events that are actually much more important than what we would say is low priority. Right. And so we have like you know, uh, things that we add in that would be relatively low priority. In fact, that most people would turn off because the volume would be a signature like an unsigned binary making a network connection. This is very, very common, right? If you look at every unsigned binary that makes a network connection, you're looking at tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of binaries that you have to classify and understand and build context for. And that's literally what is required to do this. It's part of what we do. So we go in and say, well, Dropbox.exe, they love to do updates where they don't sign the first version um, in minor revisions of the product. And so we'll get a new MD5 hash, making a network connection out to dropbox.com, and it will be an unsigned binary. And that'll fire off an alert, and it'll go to an analyst. And then what we'll do is we'll look at it and say, OK, well, this is a low priority alert. We do want to look at all unsigned binaries that make network connections. But what context can we understand that this is known good? If we go in and we say, well, if it's in C program files Dropbox and it's making network connections to dropbox.com, we know the MD5 hash, the parent process is explore.exe, it's running with right privileges, it doesn't have child processes that we don't like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have all these dimensions that we add to it. Right? We can understand under the context of these conditions, this is actually good activity. And so regardless of the priority, we can automatically resolve that if we know those with a playbook and say, playbook, look up the following activity. If it comes back true, we're good. Well, FedEx scheduler, very, very similar one, but now you add in some personal data on top of that, right? You have to be able to say, well, not only do I want to know parent process and path and MD5, well, I also might have something where the company goes, well, actually, we do use FedEx scheduler, but I only want people in the logistics team right, to be able to do that. I don't need people who are running their Amazon side hustle business doing mailing and shipping work while they're at the office. So let's limit it to a subset of people. So then you add in that kind of data. And when you're building out these kinds of things, what it allows you to do is contextualize low priority alerts and high priority alerts so that when you then have something happen like something as low priority as PowerShell execution, well, you can go in and say, well, that PowerShell execution, PowerShell is allowed in the environment. PowerShell may even be allowed in the PCR cardholder data environment, but it's not allowed by that user. And we're actually outside of working hours for that particular user. Right. This is actually a real world scenario for us where we look at it and said, this is activity happening at 2 a.m. User is 8 to 5 Eastern Standard Time for working hours. User is authorized for PowerShell, but they're not authorized to use it in the PCR cardholder data environment. We've got a pretty significant anomaly. Right? Turned out user had given up their credentials in an out of band phishing attack. And now the attacker was using RDP to log into a key environment and try to enumerate and understand systems using PowerShell. No malicious activity yet. It wasn't PowerShell Empire, it wasn't a PowerShell piece of malware. It was, however, anomalous. It did violate what we know to be good. And the context of understanding who, when, where, and why for PowerShell usage in the environment allowed us to take a low priority alert and isolate that system within 17 minutes. When we talk about context in terms of doing great detection, this is what we mean, right? For us, that comes down to simple mindsets, right? We're building what we call a trusted behavior registry. This is the key to really good MDR services for us. It is that we're going in and building in this ever learning registry of security events, right? And we, we leverage that across multiple environments. And this allows us to have a very, very powerful set of known good behaviors because people are using common tools across different environments. Like everybody's using Outlook and Word and Excel and QuickBooks and SAP and Oracle. And all these are the tools that are fairly universal IT tools, even in different business units, even in finance and marketing and all these other organizations, where we still have tools that are very common from one org to the other. And when we're looking at known good activity, well, known good activity from one environment to another has a tremendous amount of overlap. In fact, we found that known good activity from one environment to another has as much as 90% overlap. 
right? Whereas we're trying to figure out what does known bad look like? Well, known bad doesn't have a lot of overlap from one environment to another. You can't say, well, this network looks identical. So this known bad based on the network architecture and the vital systems and the executive users, and this is known bad. Well, that won't be the same from one customer to another. But when we're looking at known good, we can remove known good and analyze what remains after that based on context, right? And so then once you have that universal, then you go down to the specific, and this is that key, right? Getting into that remaining component of understanding who are the users, the systems, the scripts, who's allowed to use PowerShell and PS exec, and where are contractors VPNing in from, and for how long, and how long is the contract, and what are normal working hours? You build this contextual data, and this is how you build great MDR services at scale. So we don't apply a cookie cutter approach to say, well, here are the use cases we look at. Here are the detections, and that's all you get. We say, well, actually, what we want to do is turn on as many detections as we possibly can and then understand what known good looks like in every possible environment so that we can then scale looking at everything in your environment that actually matters regardless of low, medium, high, or critical priority. If it's not known good, a human should look at it. And that's how we get great scale for MDR services, right? So for us, what that leads to, it's about 99.95% of these alerts in production today, we're resolving with um, pre-built trusted behavior registries. We're resolving with automation and SOAR. And then that way, the 0 0.05 that remain, those are things that can get deep investigation, quick response, um, malware analysis, you know, collaboration with the customer, the things that actually matter to giving great incident response services, right? The R and MDR, which is the component that everybody seems to really care about. Well, that only works if you can scale doing the managed detection component really well first. And that's what the technology is really about. So at this point, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and wrap up my quick brief on, on, you know, how we're doing MDR and what we think it takes to do it right. Um, and I think at this point, we will kick it back to Stephen. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate that overview. And just a reminder, if you guys have questions to come up for Jordan or anybody else, throw them in the Q&A. But we are going to move to our, our next section here with Fran Watkins. And no slides for this one, just a conversation. We're going to talk about you know, how he came to decide to get MDR, what his experience has been. Um, so again, thank you, Fran, for joining us. Um, Fran is again from Centennial School District and uh, in Pennsylvania, I believe. And sure. Fran, I, I just want to start with just this kind of simple question here, kind of what are your responsibilities and, and role with Centennial School District? Um, my, role, my responsibility and role in Centennial, um, currently I'm the manager of technology. Uh, prior to that, I was the network administrator. I just became the, the, the manager in July. So I've been doing uh, the network side of it um, for the last 17 years. Um, we have, I have a small team of data, database administrators, system administrators, and we have six techs that uh, go to six of our, our buildings. Uh, we have about uh, 5,900 students that we support. Great, so it's safe to say you probably wear many hats with your small but mighty team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I'm, I mean, I'm doing the security plus everything else. So yeah. that's, uh, that's how it works. And, and that probably leads into my next question. Kind of how did you end up, you know, looking for an MDR solution or maybe even started knowing you, you had a problem, didn't even know you had MDR? How did you kind of um, come to the realization to start looking at a managed detection or response service? Um, well, a couple of years back uh, in our neighboring district, uh, someone got hit with ransomware and that kind of opened up everyone's eyes with around us uh, that we have to do something. Um, doing nothing is not an answer. Uh, in fact, I knew the district, I knew what was going on with, within the district. So I knew the players and I was concerned because it could happen, it could also happen to me. Um, so what I what we did is what is look at okay what's out there, and we looked at an MDR solution because of my, I'm basically one one person that that's on security and I kind of need a backfill of of people behind me, so that's kind of why I picked an MDR solution. Great, and and then why did you kind of settle on critical start? 
I, I did some evaluation on some, some other companies and what, it was kind of a good fit for my environment. Um, it, it's not a one fit all type thing, which like right now I, I, I use Palo Alto and XCR. You guys can fit into that. If I decided to change what I'm using, I could still use Critical Start because you're kind of like an open source. It doesn't, you don't, you don't really care. Um, some of the other co companies I was looking at, it's their product, their support, and I was kind of stuck with them. So that's kind of why I went with XDR. So. Yeah, so you, you like the flexibility of Critical Start if you changed maybe to a different you know, XDR, EDR tool, or even a, a, a different SIM or a new SIM, you know, we could support you there. Correct. That's, that's exactly why I did it. The, I, I like a relationship with the company. I don't want, I don't want to like, okay, I got this business for a while, then I'm moving to another, especially with security. You, you know, you're going to know my environment, what you do now. So if I switch to another vendor, it's not going to be a big deal. Excellent. And then when you when you started with Critical Star, how was the onboarding process? Uh, the onboarding was was great. Uh, they they we had meetings all the time in the beginning. Um, they told me my status. Uh, they told me you know they gave me basically gave me a checklist of what I have to do. I did it. I basically had an XDR client on the systems, and then what was nice about it is that they in the beginning they they showed me all the hits. And then they actually showed they actually showed me what was happening with the, the alerts and how the process is working. And then eventually, within three to four weeks, all those alerts almost like disappeared. All the high ones are gone because you were learning my environment, which made all these alerts I was getting kind of kind of go away. And one of the benefits I, I also liked about it is I use I use my uh, the SOC app on my phone. So I can see what's going on at any time. If I get an alert, I can, then I can respond. I'm not always walking around with my laptop, but I have my phone so I can actually do things off my phone to address those issues. Yeah, so you could be out, you could be out at a ball game or, or you know, a park or, you know, out on date night, right? You can, you can check on your phone and, and then go back to what you were doing. Exactly. <laughs> And, and Alex, in a, in a few minutes here, he's going to go over the um, a little demo of the mobile app for everyone, too. So that's a, a great segue to that coming up in a little bit. Um, are there any other benefits that you've seen, time savings kind of things that um, you've liked since you started using the service? Yeah, well, big time saver is that I don't get all those alerts before I was getting alerts before. OK, what did the, which ones are really important and which ones I can put aside? Now, when they come up, I know they're the important ones and I don't have to worry about what I call noise in the background. So it, it gives me a more laser focus on what I have to address. Yeah, that, that leads me to a good follow-up question. Kind of what, what does that allow you to do in, in other areas that maybe you didn't have time to before, other than go home early maybe? <laughs> well, now it, it allows me, since I got this new role, it allows me to manage, manage the other people that I'm dealing with, um, the techs and, and my other associates that I deal with. So it gives me more time to help them out instead of worrying about security issues. Awesome. And then so I know you, you have a, um, a customer success manager here, right? Who, who's, your, who's a point person for you. So you're not, you do have a person to call. So how do you, how do you like um, kind of dealing with, with not just our, our SOC, but the rest of the organization at Critical Start? Well, it's great because I, I like once a month or in the beginning, it was like once a month. Now it's every quarter. I, I, we'll, we'll do a call and they'll, they'll give me my status. What I need to, if I need to look at something or uh, if I have the address, like, like now the XDR uh, client, make sure you, I update them because there's issues with them. If I don't, um, they, they kind of gives me like a, a little bit of a roadmap of what I have to do if, if I'm not maintaining it. But for the most part, um, everything seems to be going going great, and I, I kind of like that check in. Um, it gives me it, it gives me like okay, I have to focus on this now instead of you know uh, that security at that moment instead of all the other hats I'm dealing with at the time. So I, I like it. Great, great. And I mean, is there any? I guess we'll wrap up here. Is there any kind of advice maybe you'd have for the folks in either? 
higher ed or K-12 on the phone who might be looking for, you know, a solution like MDR as far as, you know, evaluating or, or, or things that came up for you that maybe you wish you had known, you know, right when you started to look for a solution? Um, well, when, when I was looking for, one of the biggest things I was looking for a solution was I was I always looking for like a, an open source type thing so I could go anywhere. Um, that, that's what I think is important. Um, so you're not stuck with the same vendor uh, all the time. Because, it, you know, the way I looked at it, if, if the vendor's supporting the product and they have a problem, it's just, it's just basically go, it's going to circulate back to them. This way, if I'm, I'm working with Creole Start, if I have a problem with something, they're kind of my voice and they'll go, they'll go to that vendor and say, there's an issue. And that, that, that's kind of what I like about it. Excellent. I think that's, that's great perspective, Fran. Yeah, I don't think I have any other questions for you. Again, we really appreciate your time. I know uh, your peers really like hearing from each other. So um, I think it's valuable experience that you've shared with Critical Start. And um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. All right, at this point, I think we're gonna hand it over to Alex, who's gonna go through some, some cool demos for us. So Alex, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've been talking about it. Let's dive in and show what Critical Start can do. Um, Stephen, can you confirm that uh, my screen here is viewable? Yep, you're muted. Uh, yep, I think we're good. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this is our platform. Uh, we call it ZTAP. It stands for the Zero Trust Analytics Platform. And the really cool thing about this, as Jordan drew out, is this is what our analysts use. This is what our security team uses to actually investigate alerts, triage attacks that are happening. Um, and, and it includes a variety of tools that we're able to use for, the, for that. Uh, you have full and complete access to all of this. Um, you can also see here that we integrate with several different solutions. So as was just brought out, uh, it's very easy to transition from one solution to another, depending on what your needs are from an endpoint and a SIM perspective, um, without, without having a lot of pain in that transition or losing that intelligence and experience and process flow that you've developed. Um, the other important thing about a managed service is the ability to respond. And so at Critical Start, um, one of the really cool things you get is we will do our investigations for every alert, regardless of priority, in one hour or less. And we, we prove that not only within individual alerts, which are audited and tracked for how long that investigation, triage, and response takes, but also on the dashboard, where you can see how long is it taking before an analyst picks up this alert? How long after they've picked it up have they done something about it? How long before they notify you that an attack is occurring or there's some event that you need to happen? Uh, those numbers are being tracked here as well. More interestingly than that, what does it look like inside of an incident? What is the SOC actually doing? Um, and as we dive into one of these, let me pull back a little bit. Uh, oh man. You can see there's tons of alerts in here that we can um, monitor around and respond to. So if I dive into one of these alerts, um, you can see things occurring like uh, network sniffing in the environment, or you can see events like very high volume events, like, hey, a user account activity with command line, right? These are things that other organizations generally are not even looking at, uh, or an unsigned process spawning service host. Again, lots and lots of organizations are generating this activity, uh, but it's important that we look for it because these are the kinds of events that could lead to real attacks. Uh, so for instance, in this case, um, this is an unsigned process spawning a service host and our team has a wide variety of tools they can use for their investigation. Not only are we pulling in all of the individual events uh, that are occurring uh, inside of the security tool, you also see these links that we use where we're adding threat intelligence and the ability to pull threat intelligence results into the investigation itself. Uh, you can see here that we can even use the, the security tools. We've got API hooks into the different security tools. 
that we can use to pivot into those tools that you own to uh, respond to and further our investigation. Um, we can even do things like pull in threat intelligence and, and take active action to stop an attack in progress. Uh, in this case, even going to the point of isolating a host that is actively under attack. And best of all, um, you can be as involved here as you want. You can do investigations beside us, use these same tools, or just wait for us to escalate to you within that one hour SLA. Where we'll provide you contacts and what's happening on the system, uh, give you additional information on any uh, that you can research if you'd like to, uh, provide you risk information about the attack in progress, and provide specific next steps for your team. Now, this portal is designed to give you um, access and visibility into everything that we're doing, to see the tools that we have in play, to audit our analysts as they're, they're working on an incident, uh, to, 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 to track and communicate with our team, and to give yourself access to those, those investigation tools that we're going to use. But this isn't the only way that you can interact with our team. Uh, and in fact, most of our customers almost never log into these tools. In most cases, uh, our customers use our mobile app. Uh, this is a application designed by Critical Start uh, to give your team full access to the SOC and your security tools from your mobile phone. Uh, just like in the web portal, you can see instantly, how are we doing from an SLA perspective? How long is it taking us to respond? What sort of actions are we taking? You can get an idea of how many alerts there are in your environment. What are we sending to you as critical or high? These are things that we've determined there is an attack occurring that we've either contained or is active in your environment. You can see in these different modules how many things are assigned to your team. In the demo environment, that's a lot. Uh, but in real world, it's a couple a week, whereas most of the alerts end up going to the SOC. And then best of all, diving into the alerts themselves, you have that same view, but it's more targeted and quickly and efficiently understanding what's happening and acting. So diving into another alert, you can come in here, go to the comments and see immediately what is happening. Uh, in this case, um, there is a host that is being actively attacked. Uh, and while the alerts are occurring around these hacking tools, and in this case, Mimi Cats, no one is doing anything about it. Uh, the, the tool isn't actually blocked it for one reason or another. Well, as we've escalated this to our customer, we've actually also isolated the host. And you can see that being tracked inside of the incident itself, that we've taken the action because we have approval to do so to contain the threat inside of that one host. So that when we contact our customer, they're getting the full context of what occurred. We'll tell them what action is happening, what threats there are to the environment. And down here in what is recommended, we're even diving deeper into what exactly is happening, what action should be taken, what things our customers should be looking out for. And replying to this is as easy as writing a comment. Coming in, uh, this is pen testing activity. No one can type when they're being watched, just the universal rule. Uh, but you can let us know right inside of an incident. This is pen testing activity. This is just normal things that have been approved for the environment. You know, you're grateful that you told us about it, but don't do anything, right? Maybe even unisolate this host. Now, you can tell us to do that. And we'll isolate, unisolate, blacklist things, update things in your tools, or you can come in here to the events themselves and you have those same API hooks we do. So clicking into the response actions from your phone, you can isolate a host. You can unisolate a host. And where there are additional responses, you can do that right from your phone. So as was brought up earlier, if we call you at dinner or we wake you up at two in the morning, it's very easy to turn a crisis into a solved problem. A critical start may not be authorized to isolate a dev server, but you certainly are. And if it's not going to impact in production or work being done in the business, click a button on your phone, tell us to keep monitoring, finish your dinner, and deal with it in an hour or two. That's a, that's a nice story, but it's also an extremely common uh, experience for our customers where they can understand very quickly what's going on, take the appropriate action if they need to do so, and then, and then go back to their day so that there's nothing, no action they need to take, no, no other risks to the business. The threat is contained and our team is continuing to monitor and is ready to work with them uh, when they're ready to pick that back up and finish out the remediation process. 
This is how Critical Start is serving our customers. We're, we're providing them with um, all of the tools our SOC uses and full audit and reporting experience on, on what's happening there. And if customers would rather just interact with us when there's something they need to do, we have the mobile SOC with quick and immediate access into the environment and the ability to take action uh, when an incident occurs. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Stephen uh, to lead the Q&A section. Thank you, Alex. Uh, great demo there. It's great to see the mobile app. Now we only have a few minutes left. Uh, we did get a couple of questions and actually, Fran, if you're still on, the first one was for you. Um, we had someone who asked, uh, from when you started evaluating to you picked a solution, how, I guess, how long was your evaluation period? Uh, it took about six months okay. from, the, from start to finish. All right, great. Thank you, Fran. And then the, the last question is an easy one for our critical start team here. Uh, someone who's looking at maybe MDR on their long term roadmap, but they're wondering if there are things like pen testing that critical start also does that you know, they might be interested in the short term. So we do have a cybersecurity consulting side of our, our business here. Uh, we do do pen testing oft, oftentimes. Um, we have MDR customers who also do those things as well. Um, there's a bunch of stuff you can find on our, our website, criticalstart.com, uh, from pen testing to incident response to um, preparedness services like compliance preparedness and data privacy. So. Um, take a look at criticalstart.com and you, you can see kind of the other things outside of managed detection and response that Critical Start does. And I think that is it for our questions. We had one more that was answered in the chat. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, look for a thank you email for us. If you have other questions, you can reply to that. Uh, and everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you.